Never, never, never do anything anymore in economics and politics and try to go into the marketplace or into a political arena in a very broad and ambiguous form. That is suicidal. Never, never, never focus on going, doing business, talking about diversity, multicultural, people of color, minorities. That has no benefit for black folk. You've got to understand that. Once you do that, you've done several things. First of all, you tied one arm behind your back. You cannot fight for, in a broad, ambiguous form. Nobody does that but black folk. Anybody who's been in politics long enough and economics understands you must do business in a very pointed way. When you go into the marketplace like women, women don't go into the marketplace looking for very broad agendas. Women go into the marketplace fighting for women issues. Gays fight for gay issues. Uh, uh, Hispanics fight for Hispanic issues. Asians fight for Asian issues. Only black folk have been hung up on this business about going into the marketplace fighting for diversity, multicultural, minorities, poor folk, and people of color. There's a direct relationship between having the businesses and being in prison. If white immigrants can come to this country 50 years ago with nickels and dimes and no education and come here and pool their little nickels and dimes and no education into, with, and set up little stores, develop these stores into larger stores, develop this into an industry which creates job opportunities for whites. Since Lincoln was supposed to have freed the black man 100 years ago and today the black man, according to the government economist, has spending power of $20 billion per year. We feel that with the black man spending $20 billion a year, not setting up any businesses, not creating any industry, not creating any job opportunities for his own kind, he's not in a moral position to point the finger today at the white man and tell the white man that he's discriminating against him for not giving him a job in factories that he, has, he himself set up. If the black man has $20 billion, and these so-called Negro leaders are such geniuses that they can integrate white restaurants and integrate white factories and integrate, force themselves into that which the white man has set up, they should use this same ingenuity to show the black people how to pool our wealth and set up something of our own. 
and then we won't have to force our way into his anymore. One more thing I would like to point out concerning what he said about 125th Street. We don't waste our time on 125th Street, but you can reach more people in the street who want to change than you can in the bourgeoisie society, the bourgeoisie church, and the bourgeoisie circles. We, our program is directed toward the man in the street. So we spend our time in the street, and what we do with that man, instead of trying to change the white man in your mind and make, uh, make you accept us, we change the mind of the black man and make him accept himself. And as soon as he accepts himself, he'll solve his own problem. He won't be trying to force himself into your factory and into your bedroom and into your kitchen. A while back, I met with the um, college president that invited me and his board. Now, I'm not a history professor, but I had to give him a little bit of a history lesson. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? Sure. I found out that just 200 years ago in America, 92% of people were self-employed entrepreneurs. They were farmers, they were merchants, they were artisans, and they were craftsmen. And the last thing they ever wanted to do was to have to take a job because they consider that to be wage slavery. You might want to look that word up. Wage slavery is when your ability to take care of your family is dependent on someone else paying you a salary. And that's a situation early Americans never wanted to be in. And we've gone from 92% self-employed to 92% employees. What happened? So I did a little research. This whole thing started with something called the Industrial Revolution. Little guy by the name of Eli Whitney created the cotton gin, which separated the seed from the cotton. It caused the growth of chattel slavery in the South and wage slavery in the North, where women and children worked long hours in those sweat houses. Anybody familiar, familiar with some of that? And so several things happened. First of all, our, uh, the uh, Civil War occurred, and our country began doing something that they've been doing ever since. They started printing money to pay for a war that they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. That caused hyperinflation. The South lost, and people out of desperation had to take jobs like never before, over 40%. So you might want to look this up. There's a book out there. It's called For All the People, The Hidden Story of Cooperatives in America, written by a historian by the name of John Curl. And so we went to 92% self-employed, and a system was started in America. You have to be able to see the big picture and see if you can complete this sentence. This is what we were taught. We were taught, go to school, get a good education, so you can graduate and get a good what? Job. Is that what we were taught? Right. Absolutely. So that system, who does that benefit? The, the bosses. The Andrew Carnegie's, the Mellons, the Rockefellers. You know, be that what it is, well, that's the system we've been living under. Well, how, how well has that worked? <laughs> Great for them. Great for them. And so the people, ladies and gentlemen, have searched to find better ways to help one another. And one of those concepts is a concept called crowdfunding. Now, Wikipedia defines crowdfunding as the practice of funding a project or venture by raising monetary contributions from a large number of people, typically via the internet. In a nutshell, crowdfunding is 21st century fundraising. So if you're raising money for your church or your organization, your charitable causes, doing yard sales, selling cookies and candies, that's old school. So we're gonna bring you up to today, the information age, is that okay? Yeah. Excellent. Now most of these crowdfunding projects have three things in common, we're gonna break it down for you. First is they charge you a fee or a percentage of the donations for using their platform. So in other words, when the money comes in, they're going to get a percentage of it. Next, they require you to do all your own marketing. That means that you have to contact hundreds of thousands of people through your own efforts to ask for contributions. So is crowdfunding a handout? Or is there work involved? So now, crowdfunding is a new concept, but it's also an old concept. It comes from something called cooperative economics. Anybody ever heard of that before? 
I'm going to break it down for you. Cooperative economics is something that people have done throughout history to help one another when they lack the resources. So I deal with a lot of real estate agents, and one of the things I found out is that mortgages have only been around in this country since the 1930s. Mortgages were actually created and invented by the insurance company. So I asked the question, how were homes built before mortgages existed? Yeah, good question, right? Well, you either paid cash or you came together as a community to help one another. Isn't that a novel idea? Uh -huh. And so the way it works is that you would lend your time and your talents within the community to help build someone else's house. And when the time is right, the community will come over and help you build your house. Now, this concept still goes on within certain communities in our country right now. You ever heard of the Amish? Even certain organizations do it. You heard of Habitat for Humanity? But then as the ones who created the concept, the concept goes back even before the Israelites. Now, let's talk about another concept. This is a social finance concept. It's called ROSCA. You might want to research this. It stands for Rotating Savings and Credit Association, better known around the world as the poor man's bank. And I'm going to explain to you how this works. Around the world, participants make regular contributions to a fund, which is distributed in whole or in part to each contributor in rotation. So you have small groups of people, maybe five, maybe 10, and they would all agree to put so much money in a fund. But each month, each person would get to take the entire amount, go out and start a business or fund a business. So this concept has been going on around the world for years. In fact, in Latin America, it's called Tanda, Tandas. In Mexico, it's called Cadenas. In West Africa and the Caribbean, it's called Susu. In Asia, it's called We. In Brazil, it's called Quinilla. And in India and Pakistan, where I was stationed as an embassy guard, it's called the Co. And when I go out and I talk to groups, they tell me about other cultures that also have done this. Pretty interesting, right? Somebody boy, oh, oh, hey, hey, Badu, Badu, boy, oh, oh, this girl that is a I'm well She just to walk her from 6 to 12 She no get anywhere too well Look at some girls in dress, she de wear She de jump from here to there Somebody's boy, she de love to swear And if you give him chance, she go to carry your husband Go, your husband go If she enter the club before hold your man Yeah, everybody make you hold your man This girl, she be one time more She go snatch and go, she go snatch and go If she enter the club before hold your man Yeah, everybody make you hold your man This girl, she be one time more She go snatch and go, she go snatch and go Somebody go Sour. Well, it's a sour. <laughs> originally, originated from Ghana. Boom. I just wanna dance tonight. Move to the girl and spray tonight. DJ run up the south tonight. And sour bus up the place tonight. Boom. We buy up the ball and spring tonight. Move to the girl and speak tonight. I swear don't by the end of the night. I'll get what's fine. I'll be feeling alright. I'm really not now. DJ sour now. Hey yo. I'm really not now. DJ sour now. Oh, yeah. 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 Y